The Lord bless you, brothers and sisters, all God's wonderful children, all my father's children. The Lord bless you and welcome to another Wednesday evening Bible study. Amen. It is my great privilege and pleasure to be here on a Wednesday evening to share with us from the Word of God. Amen. It is a honor and I thank God for strengthening all of us, allowing us on my part to be talking and sharing with us and on your part, amen, to be listening in and, you know, together we learn and move to inject the things that we have received into our own life situations, into our own experiences. And I want to just remind us and challenge us that as we go through uh, the different scriptures and the things that we have embarked on in this study, it is my prayer that we don't just listen and don't just agree with things that we are in support of, but I really want for all of us to take the time out and to look deeply and closely at the word, at the things that are presented. There is a time when we teach and we forcefully make the points because we are convinced under God that these things are right and they are true and they are the word of God. But there is another point in our discourse where I would want to just sit back and share and open up in a kind of way that will have us to be really engaged in the things that occur in our circumstances day by day. So, you know, while we teach and present the thing, in a particular way, there will be another format every now and then where we kind of sit back and just share and talk and examine the thing together because I am convinced that families which are broken ought not to be broken. I am convinced that relationships that are shattered ought not to be shattered. I am convinced that in many instances, the lack of understanding or the misunderstanding, yes, and not to mention the input of the adversary himself has caused many, many marriages, relationships to be under stress and that stress lead to uh, destruction, it leads to separation, it leads to just collapse and that ought not to be and so in every way that I can and every opportunity that I get as we go through this subject I want to implore a child of God I want to implore a saint of the most high God that yours do not have to be dissolved it ought not to be Yours really ought not to be amongst the rocks. It ought not to be destroyed and dismantled. It is not right. It does not have to go that way. And I want to challenge husbands to reassess. Even at this point, it doesn't matter how far gone. It doesn't matter where you are. At this point, we are in dialogue. We are teaching. We are in discussion. And this must bear fruit. And I urge every husband who is the head of the household, I would urge you to look again, make the move again. Yes, understand our responsibilities, understand where we are and where we have been placed by God. Yes, and do not allow circumstances, do not allow the pressures of this world, do not allow the pressures from our in-laws and close friends and associates many of whom have no clue as to what marriage is all about. Many of them are unsaved. And it is a terrible thing 
to take instructions and guide from people who are unsaved. They don't know the word of God. They don't know how to guide you according to the word. And they will give you the best that they have in terms of knowledge. But this knowledge in many instances are, are, are based on what they know best which is the operations of the system of the world. No child of God ought to be guided and ought to be instructed and ought to take, so to speak, instructions that are opposed to the things in the word of God. You are doing yourself a disservice. You are doing your family and your situation, amen, a great injustice. Not when the Bible is there, with the things clearly outlined. And as we speak a little bit more this evening, there are a few things I'd like to just share with us and use the scriptures to show some basic principles that many of us have overlooked over the years. I am convinced that many have engaged in relationships and do not have a clue, never took the time out to do the basic in terms of research and embellishing knowledge so that they can apply and impart it to their situation. You have gone in blindly and many are at this particular place in your relationship that you just do not want to go any further. But I guarantee you, I charge every one of us, I implore every one of us, amen, by the Spirit of Almighty God, it is not a good thing for us to just get up and walk. It is not. It will affect us. It will affect you. It will affect your walk with God. It will hinder your prayers. We have gone through these things already. And the easiest route to resolving where you are, to resolving where we are in our relationship situation, is for the parties to be humble, for the parties to show and exhibit true humility and get back to the basics from the word of God, yes, and try to move in synchronism and make your thing work. Can it work? Yes, it can. Is it far gone? Is it too late now. No, it is not. And I am reminding us, I am emphatically stating to all of us that it is not too late. It was when Abraham was just about 100 years of age that that baby boy, Isaac, came and Sarah was just about 90 years of age. Everybody would have said, oh, all their lifetime, they could have gotten this son. And right when they were going over into what many would have thought was the real twilight hour of their existence, what everybody thought was impossible happened. And I'm saying you might think it is too late and it is far gone, but that is not true. And that is not according to the word of Almighty God. It is not so. So I want to encourage you, saints of the Most High God. I want to encourage every husband who is a Christian. I want to encourage every wife who is a Christian that no is a good time, irrespective of what you have gone through. There can be restoration. There can be renewal. There can be revival. Yes, and there can be a getting back together. And we would be surprised at how it can be or how it could be on this leg after a restoration. You will be surprised at what God can do. And God's word never fail. And God himself, he never lie. 
and every principle that God has placed in his word, every principle that God has shown throughout scriptures, he has a reason for putting them there for our admonition, for us to learn some things, for us to see deeply, and for us to apply the principles to our lives. And we are going to look at some principles, simple as they are, and they speak specifically and directly to relationships. But many of us might not have um, seen or accepted or received or even know that these simple nuggets are in the book. And this is one of the reasons, you know, I've said it over and over again. If we are going to be good Christians, solid Christians, we are going to have to be students of the Bible because the Bible gives us the things to do, the, the way that we are to walk and the things that we are to avoid. The Bible, the book, it is a lamp unto our feet and it is a light unto our path. And this book gives us instructions and as to how to be the best Christian that we can be. Similarly, this book gives us information, instruction, advice as to how to advance our relationships, how to make our relationships prosper, how to make them worthwhile, how to make the relationships enjoyable. The Bible, the Word of God, the Bible tells us explicitly through the different principles that it has established how to make the things happen. But many of us have failed as we pursue Christian living. We have failed in a way because we have not been studious enough and taken the word of God personally into our walk enough. We have not. And if we do not have the word, we are not going to be able to walk according to the will and the, the purpose of Almighty God. Because the word tells us how to walk. So we are many times anemic in our walk with God because of a lack of the word. And again, similarly, we are anemic as it relates to our relationship. Husbands with wives, wives with husbands. Because again, the things that are outlined in the word as it relates to relationship, we just do not know because we are not into the word. And so I want to use the opportunity again, this Bible study evening, to remind us uh, how important it is how crucial it is for us to be in the word. Uh, we might be asking many of us the question, you know, why is it that we have somehow gone on this particular subject area and we are dealing so in depth with this particular subject matter? Uh, it would be important important for us to understand again a principle in scripture because I did tell us that I was going to be going along a particular Bible study path and I put that on pause to focus on this particular matter for many reasons. A reason could simply and easily be that a lot of things have been happening and are now happening to the point where we have to shift focus to deal with a matter that is topical, that is critical, that is crucial, because we see where folks are misguided in many instances, and we see where the hand of the enemy somehow tends to step in to try to uh, cause more and more disturbance in the life of particular saints, and of course, by extension, 
within the church. If a leader sees that, he has the responsibility to change course and to focus on the matter, the issue that is at, on hand and deal with it to its fullest extent. This principle we saw coming out of us forcefully when we look at the Apostle Jude, right? The Apostle Jude was writing, and I want to read from the Bible. In fact, if, I, if we could turn to Jude, it only has one chapter. So we'll turn to the book of Jude and just the first few verses, and we will see the basic point that I am making. So it was, it was imperative for the Apostle Jude to write unto them about the common salvation. Yes, and somehow he was going to outline some things as it related to things uh, about salvation, things that he knew they needed to be aware of, etc., etc. Yes, it was important. And so while he set out to do that, some other things started to happen within the church. And he somehow segue into, away from what he would have started going into, and segue, segue and came right into a particular issue that was now at hand. And he removed somewhat from where he was going and delved into uh, what exactly was the issue at hand that was causing problems, that was causing challenges, and we are simply following the principle of the apostle, where even if we were going to go along on a particular path that is of vital importance, but something arises that requires immediate attention, just like the apostle, we segue and focus on that particular thing. And let us look together at how Jude put it. We start with chapter 1 and we read a few verses. Look at your screen as we read together. Jude, um, and we start at verse 1. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So we are seeing here that when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, I had to know it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort. So somehow Jude the Apostle was about to write on a particular thing, but then a need arise. And it was needful for him to write, not just now about the common salvation, but to exhort you now to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Something seemed to have happened. Something seemed to have come into, come onto the scene that required the immediate attention of the Apostle Jude to the extent that whereas he gave all diligence to write about the common salvation, he was now, based on a particular need, writing to exhort them to earnestly contend for the faith. Why? What thing was it that happened, that came onto the scene, that caused the Apostle Jude to now move to exhort them to contend for the faith? Verse 4 tells us, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, 
How that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. And so we don't even have to go any further. The basic point that I am making here is that while he started to write or started with the intention to write about the common salvation, there was a need that came up that he had to address and to exhort them along a certain line because something had happened. And he went on to explain that certain men were crept in unaware. It was happening right there in the apostles' time, right in their very midst. In as much as they, the apostles, were still around, those men had crept in unaware. They pretended that they were saints. They acted like they were sheep when they were really wolves. And at first, apparently, the apostles might not have known. But of course, over time, it was revealed to them. And now the apostle Jude started to write and to inform and then to exhort the saints, how they are to deal with matters because of these men that had came in unawares. It is the same way, brothers and sisters, even if it was, uh, we were set to go along a particular course, it was needful to change somewhat, to focus on a matter on hand that is pressing and that is needful as it relates to being addressed. And it is the matter of relationships. And I want all of us to be aware that it is something that while privately we deal with individuals here and there, the matter requires a broad approach as we are doing now. And hence the reason why we have delved into it in the depth that we have. And we are spending the time. And I encourage every saint. I encourage every saint. Every husband, every wife, every husband to be, every wife to be, to take the time out. Yes, and to go through these notes. And when I say notes, we didn't physically hand out notes, but they are there indelibly on the media. And you can look back and make notes and follow the things that are there because the things are Bible. And they are there to guide and to encourage and to exhort and for us to learn from. And I am submitting to all of us, let none of us have a stiff neck and a hard heart. Let none of us believe that, see there, pastor is talking to my husband and him better listen. Or a husband feel that pastor is talking to my wife or she better listen. Or and she better listen. Uh-uh. I'm talking to all of us. I have found that none of us in any relationship, that I have found it is never ever one party that cause instability. It always, because we are men, because we are humankind, we have our strengths and we have our weaknesses. And in many instances, it is, the combined weaknesses that clash. Because if it was the strength, we reinforce each other with our respective strength. But it is the weakness that tends to get in the way. And it is the weaknesses that tends to cause problems. And so all of us, while we have strengths, we have weaknesses. And I am challenging us to look at who we are and to examine ourselves and to see where we, as a husband, as a wife, have fallen short, where we could have done better, where we could have handled the situation a little differently, and we did not. And the thing is at the space where it is now, because of how we dealt with it. Some of us have been stubborn and pig-headed, some of us have been quiet and just let it rest and put on the, the silent treatment and say, oh, let it just run. But whatever we did, if it was wrong, 
it was wrong. And it is important. The principle of forgiveness that we discussed next, last week. It is important that we embrace it. And that we apply it. So that we can advance in our Christian living. It is very important. Saints of the Most High God. And so we are not going back over that. Because we examined it. And we looked at the scriptures. And if we are expecting to be forgiven of God, then we must forgive. And that's a fundamental pr principle. So none of us must say, I cannot forgive him for what he has done. Or I cannot forgive her. Of course you can. It's better you say, I will not forgive him. Or I will not forgive her. Which is a different thing. But you cannot say that you cannot. Because you can. All of us can. But then, if you will not, it means you can, but you won't. And if you don't, you are in jeopardy. Man of God. You are in jeopardy, woman of God, of losing your place. Because we cannot advance without God's continual favor and forgiveness. And we are not going to be able to access that favor and forgiveness if we are unable or feel or decide that we will not forgive. And that is a fact. So, if you want to carry on the way that you are, fine. If you want to take the advice of unsaved, fine. But I'm just making it clear to all of us that the word of God is there to be our guide, to be our lamp, to be our light. And the genuine Christians that know their God know that the word of God is paramount. I am surprised at the amount of saints that gives the word of God and the things of God the last place on their priority list. I say this to all of our shame because the almighty God who gives us breath, strength and health and life and we are here because of him. In him we live and move and have our being. He is the reason that we are here. I, I, I hear one songwriter say, I can't even walk without him holding my hands. So we are weak and we are empty and we are dry and we are nothing without him. And we know that he is God and we claim to be Christians. Christians are people who accept and embrace Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He is my Lord and my God. He is not just a Savior to me. So we recognize him as Savior and also as the only Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we know that as a fact. But then when we examine our lives, we put our job ahead of him. We put our businesses ahead of him. We, put, we take the words of our uns unsaved friends ahead of his words. We set out on our program with our children and we send them to places where we don't even pray about, where they are all... I don't know, but for those that claim to be Christians, born again, Bible-believing, let it not just be a cliché. Let it not just be a statement, but then our lives display a different reality. That God plays second fiddle in our lives. That God's word means very little to us. It must mean everything to us. It must be that light 
that shines and the illumination we walk in. Let it not merely be that we profess Christianity, but when we go to work, when we go home, when we are with certain friends, we are in relationship, husbands and wives. And when we are at work, we lambast our husbands. When we are to, with our friends, we tell everybody, all our friends and acquaintances, how wicked he is and how terrible he is. Yes, when we are with acquaintances and we are round the table playing domino with our friends, we disgrace our wives. We talk about them in, in ways that are unbecoming. And this is the wife of your youth. This is the wife that God was witness at your wedding. We are putting this gospel to an open shame. When we do these things, when we behave in these ways, any man, any husband that takes his wife, takes her name, takes your private matters at home and go and openly disgrace her because you have a difference. You are putting this gospel of Jesus Christ to a shame, an open shame. And you are not worthy to be called a son of God because this gospel is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he purchased this salvation, God Almighty, according to Acts 20 and verse 28. With his own blood, we have put it to an open shame. And any husband that does that to their wives, or any wives that do that to your husbands, you're embarrassing the Lord Jesus Christ. You're embarrassing this gospel. You're embarrassing the church. And we better be careful. These things do not go unnoticed in heaven. And so I want us to heed the exhortation. But I also want us to take heed of the warning. If we didn't know before, we know it now. There is a warning. It is not good. It is almost like treason. It is like a man taking the private secret affairs of his country and selling it to another country and they will use that later on to sabotage and to overthrow his country so they call that man a traitor and charge him with treason and if in relationships we are guilty of that we must cut it out at the roots immediately quickly Holy, W-H-O, not H-O, and get rid of that tendency. It is toxic, it is caustic, it will kill you, it will kill your relationship. And it is important that we know that. So we're not mincing the words and we're telling you straight, because sometimes we get the feeling that relationship, oh, it's just a little thing that we run into and if we don't like it, we move on. No, it is not. And if I can't get along with him, we move on so we can find somebody who we can get along with. That is not what the Bible described marriage to be. That is not how the Bible described relationship. That is how the world described relationship. And if you have that mentality. It means you have embraced the mentality of the world. And the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man talking about Christians love the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So anybody that loves the world, you are an enemy of God, Bible. So let us be very careful how we run to embrace the things that the world throws out there as the standard and as the system and we can quickly, easily put aside the things that are in the book and embrace the things that sinners 
have entrenched in their standards and gladly accept it. If you honor God, he will honor you. If you dishonor him, you will be lightly esteemed in the eyes of Almighty God. He watches out for those that honor his words. He's looking for those who fear him and tremble at his words. Not those who discard it and trample it and don't care what the words say and is what me feel I'm going to do. I challenge those type of Christians, wherever you are, whoever you are, get rid of that mentality. It will kill you. Get rid of that mentality. It will stranglehold you. And you might not even realize it, but Satan will take a hold of your life. Once you're under the influence of the adversary Satan who hates relationship, the first time that God put Adam and Eve together and the family was there and the relationship now exists, that is when Satan showed his ugly head. He hates it and he's going to do everything to destroy it. And you know that and still play into the hands of the enemy. Man of God, son of the Most High God, servant of God, Christian, Woman of God, let us follow the word. Search diligently. Seek. Push to know more. And apply these things diligently to your lives. Sit down with that husband of yours. Sit down with that wife of yours. And move to resolve it. Yes? It is for your own good. Sit down with that wife of yours, husband. Sit down with her. Sit down with him, wife. Work it out. It is for your own good. Prayers are being hindered right now. And you know it. A lot of folks are unable to pray and to reach out and to feel God now. And you know it. What sense does it make to pretend that you are okay when you are not okay? What sense does it make to put up a strong face and I will not, not after what he did or not after what she did, and you are suffering? It is a different thing, you know, when certain things have been done and you have to now move. And we looked at some of that already. And we'll look at more to come. But no one should just start at ground zero and say, this is it. Even if it feels like it, it is not it. I can absolutely tell you, it is not. And it can advance. And so last week, we indicated that there are a number of things that destroyed that can easily cause the dismantling of relationships. A number of things. And we had pointed out a few of them. And we had said the matter of communication and the, the, the matter of sexuality and the, the matter of in-laws. Yes, and the matter of money. And we had looked at a number of things. And we spent some time last time last week, in examining the husband and him taking care of his wife and family. And I'm surprised that there are folks that would have issues with that. I am surprised that there are some mean men that would have issues with that. It seemed to me that some men are still unaware of their responsibility to take care of their family. And it is your primary responsibility, man of God. It is your primary responsibility, husband. It is your primary responsibility, Christian man, who is a husband, to take care of your family. And even if 
your spouse who is your wife earns more than you because of what we spoke about and just reiterating that for clarity it is important that we work together as a team because when we got together in marriage the twain has become one so we are no one we are no a team we are now working together towards a common goal for a common good and it is therefore important that we blend that we come together that we become one that the two synergize and work for the accomplishment of great things that will advance the family so while the husband will advance the wife will advance the children will advance the family advance every wit financially and spiritually and in, in every wit even as a man if you get less than your spouse your wife then it is Im still important husbands and wives to sit together and to look at what we have and any family any couple any married people that are in relationship and you cannot or you have not to this point sat down and you know that this is what we have this is what we earn this is what I earn for my salary as a husband this is what I earn for my salary as a wife and we share this information if that is not being done you are in a bad way distrust mistrust and it ultimately will lead to a deterioration and ultimately destruction of your relationship we must understand the principle of the two becoming one one goal one objective one vision even though we have different personalities even though we have different things are different ways that we approach different things there is still one goal and objective and purpose and I challenge the men another time, you know, because this responsibility lies primarily with the men. And if in love we call for the meeting and we sit down and say, let us do what we do. But if a man don't do that, and if the same man hide what he earns, and he earns $100 and tell his wife that he get 50 and then she find out about the other 50 you're a cheat and a liar. And the cause of destruction in your family and in your relationship and you single-handedly if you do that would be responsible for the whittling away of the foundation of your marriage because the foundation must be built on trust and if you can't trust each other and if your wife cannot trust you as the head of the house to 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 say this is what i have on it this is what we're going to work with this is what i have how is she going to trust you in other things? So you are the architect of your own destruction. It is basic, it is simple, and the biblical principle is there. For this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and then take his wife and cleave to her. And be the support. Because the word husband comes from a word that means household. He's the household coordinator. He's the household head. He's the one in charge of the house, of the family. He makes sure that they're covered. And even if you earn a dollar and she earns 10, by just sitting and talking and working it out together, you are playing your role as the head of the house to organize and to bring it together and to work a strategy to make the thing work for the benefit of all. If as a man you go aside and say she earned more than me. So she on her own makes you pay this, this and this. And you buy a pound of rice. And a container of milk. And then leave that in the house and say because she earned more makes you buy the rest of things. You're not a man that is in charge of your house. And you have put this faith. 
to an open shame. So every man must be honest with their wives as they work out the matters relating to their households. And but pastor, she earned more than me, so what? You are the man. Certain things would have changed in society, but you are still the man. You are the head. It's, and it's not pastor gave you that responsibility. It is God. I have found that there are some people that hide from pastor and say, don't tell pastor that. And so they, they fear pastor and don't fear God. How can that be? You're, if you fear pastor and you do not fear God, you are living a lie. You are living a lie. Because God is the one that you must fear, not man. God. And if you can be blatant in the presence of God, but hide from a man, you are, you, you are not truthful. You are living in denial. And you are not a man of this faith. We said the word father comes from a Hebrew word that when that means that is Abba. And it doesn't just mean father in the sense of a man procreating and having an offspring. It literally means source that takes care of so that the man is going to leave his father and mother. Notice the Bible says a man must leave his father and mother. It never said a woman. The man is going to leave because he's going to become his own nucleus and his own source. Then he's going to take away that woman from her source who was her father. And take her to yourself. So you husband now become her source. And that's why from as far back in antiquity as we can go. We see this natural process. Of a man taking care of a woman. And of a woman having this innate desire. To be cared for by a man. And even if she have things. And even if. She was left with valuables from her parents and have things. That desire that is there innately is going to come to the fore so that if she have a million dollars, it is immaterial to the inside need that she have, that she wants her husband to cater to her and to focus on her and to take care of her. If she have a million dollars, she would share it with him. And give him half and everything. If he goes to the store and buy her a brand new dress. And say honey look what I bought for you. She treasures that a million times more. Than if she took her own money. And go in a store and buy a dress for herself. Because she has that innate. Desire. To be treated. To be taken care of. By her lover. Her spouse. Her husband. It's not a matter of what she have. It is a matter of how she's made up. And that's the reason why even lady with, ladies with things still look to their spouses and their husbands. Even in the world, they look to their fiancés and their boyfriends for things. It's not greedy, they're greedy. It is a natural desire. Because men take care of women. All the way back to Genesis. And you now come to say she earned more than you. So you're not giving her nothing. And she's on her own. And she better buy the food. And I will pay for the light bill. And, and, and that's it. She don't know what you earn. She don't know nothing. She, you don't even know how food come in the house. And you're a man. And you're the husband. Embarrassing. And I'd love to find out some of these husbands. So that we can talk one on one. You know. And, and be frank and open and to pluck the shame out of the eyes of men because we make it bad for other men 
But that is not how the Bible teaches us. That is not how we are groomed from the word of God. And it is therefore important that we are so groomed. So I touch on that just to clarify and for us to know that if the thing is going to work, yes, we need to work together. And we need to understand our roles as men. Even if your wife is working, you must still make the effort to take care of that particular need. She needs to get something from you. She needs to know and feel that you care for her and you want to support her. She must be supporting herself and supporting the children and you just come home and eat. So I want to talk to some of these wives so I can advise them how to treat with husbands like you, which is according to the word of God anyway. We just make it difficult. And that is a fact in many relationships. I happen to know that there are some relationships where one or the other of the parts just make it difficult to work. That is not right. So let us get back to basic Christianity and look at the studies that we have been doing over these weeks and see how we can make the necessary adjustments. Now, having spoken and said what we said last week, that there were a number of things that contribute to the destruction. And we say one of them was money. And we dealt with that last week. There was another one. So we're going through a few of them. We're talking now and we're sharing. And this is our in-laws. And we must be very, very careful because the Bible makes it expressly clear that, look, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So your parents will always be your parents, right? Your brothers and sisters will always be your brothers and sisters. That's not going to change. But what has happened is that in the course of the relationship, remember now, husbands are supposed to leave their base and take on their own family, join himself to his wife and stick to her like crazy glue. For this cause, a man must leave mother and father and cleave, stick, glue to his wife. That now becomes your family that you are the head of. You're not the head of the family where your mother and father was. No, they are your parents. You're not the head of their family. You are an offspring. You are now the head of your own family. And every man must look out for his family. Your first obligation is to your family, your wife, and your children. They are the ones that you first protect. They are the ones that you first provide for. They are the ones that you first take care of. They are your responsibility under God. You nurture them. You teach them. You give them the word. You have prayer time. You have that quiet time. You talk, you share, you go out, you do things to get whatever you have to do. That is your responsibility as, as a man. God gave that to you and you are going to be held accountable, O oh man, for the family that God gave you and how you took care of it. Because the children are an heritage of the Lord. They're not just your children. They belong to God. He gave them to you. Hannah put it this way. You, you have given me, I'm not going to lend him back to you so that you can use him. You, Samuel, I give him back to you. It's like you didn't lend him to me. And I'm lending him or giving him back to you. Use him. We need to understand what family is, what relationship is. God has a stake in every marriage. It's not just you and your husband that, boy, if I don't like her anymore, so I'm going to just move on. Move on where? 
I don't like him anymore, so I just go and move. Move on where? And all you folks that encourage the move, watch out. It is not only those that do the evil, and the Bible lists the evil, but those that take pleasure in them that do it, or those that aid and support them that do it. So the ones that are doing it have a God to confront, but the ones that support them in the wrongs that they are doing, you're going to face God too. And I'm not talking at the judgment. Right here. So be very careful. Be very careful. Understand that relationship, husband and wife thing, is not just husband and wife thing. Husband and wife thing is husband, wife, and almighty God. And we're not going back into what we teach already because we have gone through that according to the book of Malachi. That he was there as a witness. And it shows you why he was there. Because he was ensuring that his interest was well taken care of. Because mark you, God has an interest in every relationship. Because they are set, when he set it up in the first instance, it was to achieve his purpose. And we have gone through that already. Woe if we try or attempt to frustrate the purpose of God because of lack of knowledge or because people are instructing you into doom. Settle down, get into the word, understand what you're in, understand what God requires and work it out. Very important. Very, very important. So, in-laws are precious people. No husband is going to want to know that his mother or his father or his brother or his sister is in need and don't move to assist. No wife would want to know that her parents our siblings are unwell and need help and don't move to assist. And therefore, no husband and wife should be talking. I know of instances or I've heard of instances where um, the husband is telling the wife, don't talk to your parents. Or the wife is telling the husband, don't go deal with those people over there. I know it's your siblings, but I don't like them. Don't talk to them. That is not biblical. And you are only setting yourself up for failure. How can that be? Where is the Christ-likeness in an argument like that? It is wrong. It is unbiblical because you are setting up a, a system of hatred. And it is therefore wrong. No man can tell his wife, should tell his wife to not talk to her in-laws. No woman ought to tell her husband, you don't like his mother and therefore don't talk to her. That is wrong. Absolutely wrong. Emphatically wrong. And if we have a tendency... To advise our spouses who to talk to and who not to talk to. And I am the man, the head. Don't talk to that. If you're married for five years, it is five years of pretense. Because I know that that wife is uncomfortable with you. I know that that husband is uncomfortable with you. And it is just a matter of time before the lid blows off. So there are some things that are basic and no Christian person should be telling another Christian person, don't talk to that one. Don't talk to that one. Keep malice with that one. And what, what is that? So already that is not Christian-like. And therefore you are acting in the capacity of a man or woman of the world. Your relationship cannot succeed. Your marriage will not go far. You are becoming controlling and controlling in a way that is negative, that is 
and biblical and everything that you can put and attach to it. It is wrong. So I therefore want to charge couples that have the tendency to instruct who your spouse should speak with and not speak with or which family member you don't like and therefore they must not associate with. It is not right. There can be other ways of dealing with situations that you don't have to be face to face and you don't have to be confronting them and therefore the issues don't have to come out like that. And therefore what we need to do is to apply knowledge and deal with our spouses according to knowledge. There's nothing like knowledge and understanding. And we need that in our relationships now more than ever. So we can deal with issues like these that will arise. They always will. But they must not be dealt with in a devilish, diabolical way. With instructions being given who to talk to and not to talk to. And who to never make come to this house. And if they come to this house, that is it. This, this thing is dissolved. What kind of standard are we setting in our relationships? And then expect to have a loving, all-embracing relationship. It will not happen. And we just need to know the facts and stop pretending. So in-laws, we must love, according to the scriptures, children, obey your parents. So all when you're married, you're to be obedient to your parents. So you must love them. Love your family. But the primary responsibility of the man and the woman in this new family structure is first to your own family. So husband, what does this mean? It means if you go to look for your mother and your father and your mother and your father calls you one side and tells you that you know I don't like your wife you know and every time that she come I just have a negative feeling and they're telling you what to do and they don't like how she put the thing on the table when she's helping to spread the thing and she's this and she's that and I don't think it was the right choice that you make and when you go home you know call your wife and say you know I don't even know if I tell you this you know I'm not even sure this thing going to work I'm a mother and she have a way you know she, she know for discern spirit and she just can't take your spirit and what wrong with you honey you are a weak husband. You are a jellyfish husband. You are a husband without balls. Really. Every husband must stand up for your wife. She's your wife already. And you cannot tell her that she's not. She is your wife already. You and God spoke. You prayed. She's now yours for the rest of your life. And you are going to let your in-law tell you that she's not good for you. You don't have to be disrespectful. You don't have to be rude. You must be respectful, especially if it is your parents, but respectfully, <coughs> sorry, respectfully, you're going to say, but mom, you know, I hear what you say, but this is my wife and I love honey. And if you can't, you know, accept her, I'm still your son, but we might have to be here less than we are here because you have a responsibility to take care of that family that you are now the nucleus of. You don't let others take advantage of your wife. You don't let others push her down and you agree with them. 
You don't do that. Similarly, wives, if they don't like your husband and they say that he's too this and too that, you come back to your husband and you're telling them this as if you, you, are, you have now taken side. But you say, but is there so a bond and come from? It doesn't matter if you're born there. This is where you are now with your husband. A new unit. So with all the respect in the world, tell your auntie, tell your uncle, tell your brother, tell your sister, this is my husband. And he loves me. And I love him. And we are together. And we will be together for the rest of our lives. Now, if they still hate you or don't want you to come back to the house, brother, sister, don't go back. Stick to your husband, stick to your wife. If there is a disagreement, however, and they are not running you away, and just be kind enough, be Christian-like enough, be manageable enough to attend to the issue, but at all times to be in defense and support of your husband, of your wife. That is where your first love now is. That is where you have responsibility now and your children that you have together and you protect them. It is not that in-laws hate your spouse. It is just that they know you because you grew with them over the years and they will always attempt to defend you at the expense of your spouse. But man, you must be man enough to say you can defend yourself and not having them taking side with you against your wife. And then you join in with them and turn and say, e -he, e -he, why you keep doing that? Why you go home and sort out your matter and leave your mother's house. Mama's boy, mama's girl, go home with your husband and with your wife and work your matters there under God and stop letting your mother who is going to take up for you, son, or your mother and your father who is going to take up for you, daughter, be the mediator. It must not happen and we must at this point understand that these things introduce tension into relationships and cause ultimate destruction. So we must deal with that. When, 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 when this parents or the uncle or the aunt who know you or the, the siblings who know you say look what kind of person she is you notice when you go out uh, you're always active and clapping and show and she just sit down there dead and you now turn around and look at that and come home now or even there take her on why are you so dead everybody excited everybody jumping around and you just sit there quietly. Then tell me something. When you got married to her, wasn't she of the quiet type? And you were attracted to the quietness? And the, the humility? And the softness? And the easiness? Because while that might be a turn off for some, it is a turn on for others. You knew that this is how she was. You knew that this was her temperament. You knew that this was the kind of lady, woman that you were going to get married to. And after knowing all of that, you got married to her. Then, brother, you are going to have to live with this for the rest of your life. Don't tell her to be what she's not. Wife, you got a husband like that? Or that is quiet and you are the bubbly type? Always effervescent and shouting and skipping and the life of the party and everything. And he's calm and easygoing. And then your friends. What you met at, meet at work. Start to show you other guys 
that are active and energized and extroverted and all of a sudden you, you like that kind of personality and you already was attracted to and married to a quiet type of guy. No, you want him to change. He cannot change. That's who you married to. And that's who you're going to have to live with for the rest of your life. That's how it is. Can we live with such a person? Of course we can. I believe that as Christians, young people, middle-aged, those getting older, there is a tendency to look, and we have to watch this eye gate, because you see the things that we focus on, we start to like and gravitate to. And, and we see the companies that we keep, we must be very careful, because now they start to instill certain things inside of you, and all of a sudden, what you used to appreciate, and who used to be good, and who used to be there for you, even though he was calm and quiet, and, uh, but yet resourceful and loving, you no longer like him? Or because she is the effervescent type and up and around and then you see a quiet, easygoing person that is calm and people tell, tell you that this is the kind of person that you must go with, man. They're just focused and they're not easily perturbed and it was cool and calm. All of a sudden, you don't like your wife's attitude. She's too effervescent. She's too full of life. Brothers and sisters, let us get back to basics in terms of our Christianity and who we are. Yes? And do not let the systems of the world dictate into our minds who we should be married to and who we must leave and what kind of husband we must have based on where we work and what kind of business we have and based on who you rub shoulders. Let go. Come back into our Christianity. Understand right now the temperament of your husband. Understand right now the temperament of your wife. There are certain things that can change about a person. But did you know that there are other things that cannot change? And, and, and the big mistake that a lot of relationship just make is to believe that things will be better if he changes and become like this or if she change and become like that not realizing that there are some things that just will never change about a person the Bible tells us, I believe it is in the book of Proverbs, you know, the Bible tells us uh, a couple of things. And it is important that we learn and follow through on the word of God. And God makes all things in his way. For variety, God makes everybody different. Just look at the type of personalities around. Variety. You think a man just choose to be quiet? You think a woman just choose to be full of life and extroverted? We didn't get to choose who we want to be. We were born with a certain temperament. Remember now, temperament and character is different. We can develop character. We can mold character. Yes, our characters are determined by, yes, a part of our temperament, but added to that, who our parents are. If we are church people, where we go to school, where we grow up, if we become Bible believing Christians, a number of things come together. To help to mold our character. So that a man now who is honest and does things a certain way. He develops that attitude over time. By virtue of yes who the kind of personality that he has. 
But added to that now to develop the character, you know, if he reads and subscribes to the Bible and live according to the Bible, if his parents were honest, hardworking, moral parents and instill those qualities in him, if the community was a little village that looked out for everybody, so he grew with a certain or she grew with a certain kind of support system around, all that comes together to help to form the character. But the basic personality we get from God, our parents and our grandparents, the, the, the chromosomes and everything came together and shoot into our DNA. And when we came built into us, is a particular DNA that determines the kind of personality. If we are going to be quiet, if we are going to be introverted, if we are going to be flamboyant, if we are going to be effervescent and extroverted, and a number of different things. And we have to know that there are some things about our spouses that will not change. So that the key to the marriage working is known as a thing called, and we call it, the principle of acceptance. Some people go through weeks and months and years of turmoil beating down their spouse to change into something that they could never be. Not realizing that even the spouse that we're beating to change what you perceive to be a weakness, he has so many other strengths that you could embrace and then make adjustment to your own self to accept some of the very things that are his weaknesses. You can help him to develop the weaknesses, but if some things... It's just a weakness that is associated with that kind of personality. And all of us, as nice as we all can be, have some weak spots and things about us that are weak. And when that emerge in relationships, brothers and sisters, they cause problems. But the key is the principle of acceptance. The key is the principle of knowing that it is not everything that we are going to be able to change. And that is very, very important for us to recognize the principle of acceptance. What is it about my husband that he is just no matter how we try this thing is just there but at the same time he's such a nice person because he he always takes care of me he does his out of the way to get this sorted out him look after the children and yet him have this weakness and i go and beat it all the time because i feel it is a, a demon and i go and cast it out if it's the last thing i do i go and beat it out of him why kill yourself? Why kill ourselves? There are some things that we will never change. And I'm going to tell us this. It is rare, very rare, that people change after they get married. So if you know certain things before and you just run to get married because I can't wait, I have to marry to him. No, I have to marry to her. No. But I, when we married man, I'm going to fix that. See, I'm going to be the perfect per Perfect. So many times we start off incorrectly. Usually, individuals do not change. Now, attitudes can change. And if we have bad attitudes, that must change. Nobody must put up with bad attitudes and sarcasm and those kind of things. Not talking about that. Those are things that can change. How we were cultured over time allow us to not do some things and to do some things. As we grow together, we can learn from each other and certain things change. 
So there are things that can change. But we are not talking about the attitudes and the, 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 the sweeping of the driveway and the cutting of the lawn and the washing of plates or the this or the that. And things like those that can change. But we are talking about certain traits of the personality that you want a quiet husband to be lively or a quiet wife to be lively and you're pushing them to be what they are not and because they can't matriculate into that particular mold it now becomes a problem and I, it, it, it is an issue, an issue and the key as I said is for us to appreciate and for us to accept the principle of acceptance we can we literally can and should move to accept who our spouses really are accept it and even if that is the part of the relationship that was giving us problems, that was giving us, you know, challenges, that was an issue, it is important that we learn to accept who our spouses are and accept some of the weaknesses that we will never change. Yes. Can we do that? Yes, we can. This thing that is being bandied about, that I will not put up with this and not put up with that and not put up with that and if that is going to be there, I am gone. It is Satan's way of introducing himself into the marriage to break it up because you will never get a perfect husband. You will never get a perfect wife. And we need to wake up to that realization. Now there are some things that no wife should put up with. And there are some things that no husband should put up with. A husband that is normally out late playing domino with his friends. And come home 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock. That's not a personality trait. That is something acquired over time. And any man that stays out 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock and his wife dislikes it and speaks about it and he continues to do it. It is a man that does not value his God-ordained responsibility and that does not value his wife and that does not value his family. No man should let a wife be begging them to come home. The only kind of persons where wives have to beg men to come home midnight and one are men who, without doubt, are either in rum bar, prostitute house, or places like those. No Christian man should allow his wife to be wondering at 11 o'clock in the night where he is. That's a shame. That's a disgrace in the house of God. You're an embarrassment to the faith. Similarly, there are things about women that a man is not going to accept. And that is not personality traits. You can't be up and around with your friends and say, I am just with the girls, I am just with the group. And that is after hours when you are called upon because you are not home. That is wrong. That's an embarrassment to the faith. Yes. And the apostles speak about it. Because the, the, the apostles spoke about certain actions that can cause people to become an embarrassment to the faith and declare that they are not fit to be in this faith. The Bible says that a man that does not take care of his own house 
is worse than an infidel. And is not to be associated with this faith. Should not. So we must be careful, men and women, that things that can be changed, we change. We change it so that we can synchronize and flow together as husband and wife. No husband must accept a wife that says she can't help it because she has to stay out with her friend till midnight. Do not accept it. That is wickedness. No wife should accept a husband that 12 o'clock in the night you don't even know where they are and they say you worry too much that I was just with friends or I was teaching own Bible study. Do not accept that. We do not allow anybody to teach own Bible study at 12 o'clock in the night and your husband or your wife don't know where you are. If they know and it is agreed, it is different. If they don't know and you don't communicate that, you are not doing this faith any favor. And you're not doing God a favor because you're messing up and mashing up what he instituted. You're being deceptive. And we need to be aware and to wake up to these realities. So these things must change. But the basic personality and some of the flaws and weaknesses that comes with it, we are going to have to learn to accept. I want us to turn together to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. I want us to, let's read it together. Simple scripture, but we need to know exactly what it is bringing out to us. Ecclesiastes chapter number 11 and the verse 13. Let's put it up on the screen. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and the verse 13. A simple scripture, but let's read it together. And it should be coming up on your screen, screen momentarily. All right. So it says, consider the work of God. For who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? Brothers and verse 13, just verse 13. Brothers and sisters, God wants us to be joyful and to be happy. And happiness, husbands, wives, comes from accepting what we have and getting along with it. Conflicts really come about when we struggle with certain things that we cannot change. So look at who we have. Look at the person that we have. Bask in their strength. And then understand that there are certain things that no matter how we try, we will just not be able to change. It is important that every married couple understand that people and i said it before you know i'm just reiterating just because i want us to be very clear in our minds right understand that people usually do not change much when they get married but as a couple we can choose to be happy in the marriage when we just get to the point where we learn to accept who we have and that that is a key to acceptance it's a, it's a simple key yes just appreciate who we have there is a tendency to judge somebody not based on their strength but based on their weakness i want us to change that practice elevate the person and commend the person based on their strength and know the weakness assist them as best as we can 
But we must know when this is something that's not going to change and put ourselves in the position to, to move, to accept that. And that is very, very important. There is, a, there is a, an old prayer. I think it was made by St. Francis Xavier. Now, we are not Roman Catholic people at all. But there is something in those words that is applicable to the very things that we are um, presenting and projecting right now. You remember that prayer for those who went to Catholic school um, when they're praying, God grant me the courage to change the things I can change. The serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And the wisdom to know the difference. Because, brothers and sisters, there are some things that we can change. And by all means, if it is going to enhance and advance the relationship, push for the change. Because it's, it's going to make the thing even better. But then there are some things that we can't change. And we're just not accepting that we can't change it. And so the end of the prayer said, give us wisdom. Give us wisdom. To know the difference. The difference between what we can change and what we cannot change. And it do make sense we beat a dead horse. So there are four things that we must accept. And I want every married couple to understand that there are four things. Yes, every married couple must accept. One, accept the temperament of your spouse. Do not try to change your spouse's temperament. We said that already. Rather, pray that he or she will become more spiritually mature. Because the more spiritually mature they are, yes, even with that particular weakness, if we choose to call it that, which is, and it could very well be a weakness. With that spiritual maturity, you and the person will deal with it in a more positive way. But it is important, one, to accept the temperament of your spouse. Very important. Two, accept the masculinity or the femininity of your spouse. What do I mean by that? A man must accept that he is married to a woman and not a man. So he must not try to suppress her natural feminine trait. You know, like her talking, because ladies are made to be expressive and emotional and to talk and to express in certain ways the things that affect them and they do it different from men. A man won't talk his mind in that way. A man will more act and speak less. But a woman is different. She will talk more. She will be more expressive. She will be more emotional even for simple things. So every man must accept that he is married to a woman. And not a man. If you want a spouse that don't talk much, and when you do anything, them just take it and just act, move on and like a man. That means it's a man you want to marry to. And the Bible forbid that. It's a woman that every man must get married to. And so understand and accept her femininity. And we will see that that goes a far way. She is also the weaker vessel, men, and must not be expected to, be expected to behave and function like a man. And so that is very, very, very important. Very important. So two things we read so far. Accept the temperament of your spouse 
and accept the masculinity and femininity of your spouse. And that is very, very, very important. Similarly, wives, don't expect your spouse to be treating you and talking to you like a woman. You know that there are certain things that ladies share naturally amongst themselves. That even though they, are, they might have a soul tie with their husband and they share a lot of things, they are more expressive to another female with certain things. Don't leave and say, I can share it with Mary and I can share it with Sue and I can share it in the way that I want to share it with you. Why you don't? Because he's a man. Of course you can share it. You might feel that he is not receiving it, but he is receiving it. It is just that how he expresses emotion because he is a man. You might feel that he is untouched or he is unmoved. But he is very much moved. But he does not react in the way that a woman will react. So a woman reacting in that way, I quite understand that you would want to embrace her. You would want to, you know open your arms to her because you see the emotional response but men are not that emotional so you will not see the response in that particular way and wives need to understand that and stop chastising your husband that they are not caring they show and display care in a different way from a woman and so the key to acceptance is understanding the femininity and the masculinity of your spouse. I know of so many men that, I mean, you don't see them crying, but in one-on-one -on -one discussion, you see tears well up in their eyes. Their wife thinks that they don't care. Sir, I care. If you know what I did, I did this, did this, did that. But the, guess what? The wife don't see that as caring, not realizing that they display care in two different ways. And because the lady is expecting him to be emotional and hug her and cry and say, no man is going to hug you up and cry to show that he cares. He's going to, you will never see his tears. And he's going to, okay, I understand. And be, you know, in his male voice. And he might be tearing out on the inside, but it is not going to necessarily be shown like how you would show it. Because he's not a woman. If you want that response, you're then go get married to a woman and you're forbidden to do that. And so it is important that we understand that. So that's two. Three, accept the negative things in your spouse's character. So we're going to diagnose the negative aspects of the spouse's character. And if after talking and trying certain things... Other things work. You see the strengths. The strengths are heavy and they are more. But then there are certain weaknesses, certain negative aspects. We can accept. And this is both ways now, you know. This is husband accepting certain of the weaknesses in your wife or the negative things. And this is wives accepting some of the weaknesses or negative Things that are resident in your husband. It is very important that we come to a point where while we accept the positives, we are going to have to come to the recognition and not stand up and say like others are pushing and forcing you to say, don't accept that. If it is something that is irrational and outrageous and out of the way, quite fine because, you know, we don't put up with abuse. So we're not talking about abuse. But there are negative traits just like you have. You both have them. So it is important, brothers and sisters, to accept the negative things in your spouse's character. It is a part of the key to acceptance. And when we accept certain things, we have an outlook on our relationship that is totally different than we might see now. And then fourthly, 
accept the physical structure or looks of your spouse. Many times when individuals get married, they are slim and trim and all shaped up and everything. And men love to go boast off about how their wives are trim and this and that and all the things. And similarly, wives boast about their husband, how him tall and muscular and all kind of things. But you know, after a certain time, guess what? Things change. After a certain time, things come around to a point where the man his tummy gets a little or a lot more away from his chest. Like, you know, the keeping malice want to stay far apart. And after a while, your wife, she puts on weight and her tummy not as flat and the physical structure change. I know men that secretly harbor divorce proceedings in their minds because of how their wives look. I know women who want to have husbands that look different from how their own husband look now. But another key to acceptance is a accepting the physical structure and structuring of your spouse after you've been married. You see, after 10 years and 20 years and 25 years, everybody look worse if children come, everybody tend to look different. Yes? Physical features change. The black hair start to turn gray. Um, you know, the, the structure that was tall and taut, you know, start to bend over a little bit. And a lot of things just change. Not as active as you once were, and things just change. And we have got to learn to accept even our physical structuring over time. It is the key. You cannot, after 20 and 30 years, look over of marriage, look over at a 25-year-old, 30-year-old, and say, why can't my wife look like her? Why can't my husband look at him? Look at who you have and accept them. Accept their physical structures accept the weaknesses that they have accept their masculinity and femininity and accept their temperament brothers and sisters this is real this can happen you and I can accept certain things about our spouses. And you see, the moment and the day that we accept these weaknesses and say, this is my husband, this is his strength, I will work around the weaknesses. This is my wife, I embrace her strength, these are her weaknesses, I will work around these weaknesses. The day that we move to capture and to accept these four things is the day when certain changes start to come in a big way into our relationships. I want us to understand that. I want us to accept that. I want us to see that. I want us 
to believe that that is how it is that is how it is and i'm speaking reality all those people that are for five and seven and eight and ten and twelve years of marriage still searching for a perfect husband and a perfect wife time to wake up he is not yet made she is not yet made so instead of throw her out or throw him out because of perceived weaknesses the next one that you get if you think they're going to be perfect you're sadly mistaken and the devil has blinded your eyes blind we are not perfect so let's rivet it in our minds that there are some things that we will have to accept and we can the mind is so powerful and if we start to cultivate a mental attitude that i am going to love this woman i am going to love this man i am going to love this woman i am going to love this man after a while by training our mind in that way because that is how the mind is set you know and that's why god when he was talking about spiritual things and advancing spiritually he spoke about the mind that we must bring it into subjection and then in another scripture he told us how we must train the mind so that whatsoever things are good and whatsoever things are honest and whatsoever things are of good report and he goes on that if there be any virtue or if there be any praise think on these things we can start now to think on certain things about our husbands that we will accept and certain things that we will proceed with and that i am going to love my wife irrespective of and start to feed that into our minds because it ultimately becomes a part of our being because as a man thinketh so is he we become what we think so when we start to think that i will love her no matter what i will love her irrespective of her physical structure at this time i will love her instead irrespective of some of the weaknesses at this time i will love her because god said to love her and i choose to love her after a while that is going to develop in your psychology and develop within your personality and you are going to become that type of person that choose to and does in fact love your wife but the mind has to be so trained many of us have not trained our minds we look and we wish and we wonder and we want and no 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 appreciate who you have now appreciate that husband of yours Appreciate that wife of yours. Gloat in his strength and learn to accept his weakness. Gloat in her strength and commend her for her strengths. But those weaknesses that just are unable to be changed around and it's just dear, dear, dear. Learn to accept them and love her even with that weakness. The love must be condition unconditional. Unconditional love. And your respect for your husband must be unconditional. And just train our minds to embrace that and to work with that. And don't accept. Because there are some things, you know, that we can accept. And then there are some things that we must reject. Accept peace. Tell yourself that I am going to accept peace in my relationship. Yes? I, I don't, this is what I want. I want it to be calm. I want there to be, yes, a sense of tranquility and peace. We can accept that. We can tell ourselves and train our minds and determine and decide that I want peace and tranquility. And the Bible tells us, you know, 
And if both of us, and this is why it is important that we go back to first principles and understand that we are called first to be saints. Because as a saint, we are guided by the Bible. And Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 8 tells us, you know, if it be possible as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Is Bible telling us as Christians to do that, you know? If we can live peaceably with all men, what says your husband? What says your wife? We have to determine and establish a mindset that this is what we want. And this is what I am aiming for. This is where I am going. And so I would charge us and exhort us determine in our minds the kind of relationship, the kind of liberty that we want and then strive for it as much as light in you if it be possible live peaceable so it is saying that it is not always going to be like that but as much as possible Live peaceably with all men. It can be done. And that's Bible, Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. Read it. Yes? And, and, and move to do that. Accept that in your relationship. Right? Um, but, and there's James chapter 3 also, verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace Acts, this is james chapter 3 verses 17 and 18 brothers and sisters accept peace and decide not to fight and quarrel even if it is happening now you're going to accept peace and you're going to make up that i'm going to cut this out we're going to reduce this and, and this goes both ways. We're going to reduce this. Establish the mindset. Establish the mindset from now. And make it happen in your relationship. It is very, very important. Accept. So apart from accepting peace. Accept that it is your Christian duty not to provoke one another to wrath and bitterness. Basic things to accept. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. Right? Simple scripture. And let us consider one another to, prov to provoke unto love and to good works. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and unto good work. Not unto anger and bitterness. We must accept what we want. We must sit back and look at ourselves and look at our relationship and determine what we are going to accept and what we don't want in our relationships. What we don't want in our marriages. And instead of pointing a finger and saying, you causing this and I don't want it, we are going to know Look at ourselves and take certain steps. And I'm speaking to husbands and I'm speaking to wives because one hand cannot clap. And so it is important for us to understand these principles, simple, and just apply them. Understand them and apply them. Having said that, I think I'm going to call it for this evening because there are a few things more that I want to go into which is a little different from this so it's new and different still associated but because it is different I will take a different study and go into those things so we call it quits for this evening but again I say to all of us this thing can work this thing must work. And we have the capacity, we have the potential, we have the power, 
we have the authority and we have the word of God to make it happen. Let us not sit on the sideline and think that it is just over and God bless Brother Daly. He's saying the right thing, but it's not applying to me because my own finish. No, do not accept defeat. Do not accept defeat. And if you're a husband or a wife and you have been hurt, don't sit on the earth and just say, me not where I make a move. The principle of forgiveness is this, you know. If you go to the altar and they remember, not that you have art against your brother, but that your brother have art against you, and it hits you, dear, you get up and go find him. So don't wait for him. Don't wait for her. Like you want him to drop and say, oh, I was wrong, I was wrong. And if them can't do that, there will be no forgiveness. Forget that. That is not Bible. And my fear is that a lot of folks who profess to be Christians just don't know the word. And this is to your detriment. But thank God we are going through together. All of us are learning and we're getting into the word and we're try, trying our best to follow this word and to strengthen ourselves. As a man, as a woman, as a husband or as a wife, just understand don't wait for the other person and say, boy, it's just admit says you cause it. Forget that. That is not how reconciliation is done. Let the person if each say, you know, this is where we are. It shouldn't be here. I know I did some things. Don't wait for her to tell you, I know you do some things too. You jump in and say, boy, I do some things too. Vice versa. Just put the thing out there and start chopping it down. Start chopping it down. Start getting it together. Because you have no alternative. And the thing can happen. And I know that there are folks, before they move now to go on some days of fasting and prayer and see the face of God to tear down mountains and to get the thing together according to his word. What have they done? Nothing. No prayer. No fasting. It, it make we see how it comes to it's not gonna happen just like that. That's why I want us to be Christian because the thing can happen. Just be the kind of Christian who know how to seek the face of your God in fasting, in prayer, in the word, and allow him to direct you as to how and what to do and to do what you must do quickly. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come again and we thank you. Bless the family. Bless our brothers and sisters. Bless your children, the church of the living God. Thank you again for allowing us to be here in Bible study. Thank you for allowing these thoughts to come out and to flow over. Help, almighty God, that we will embrace and take the things that apply to us so we can make ours a better relationship and thereby be drawn closer to Almighty God. We are aware that when we are out of synchronism and out of line, our very prayers can be hindered. Help us, Almighty God, to fall in line so that we can walk with you freely and worship the great and the mighty God. Have your own way. Let your perfect will be done. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. The Lord bless you richly. Thank you again for joining us in Bible study. And God's willing, next week, same time, uh, to continue on the series of relationship. It, there is so much. And we will go as deep and far and then we stop. But let it flow for a while. And I want us to take the different segments, go through, put them together and just do the best we can for our relationship. God bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.